Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the Halftime Talk feature interview series. I'm delighted today to be joined by Jorge Montepeque, who is MD of Benchmarks at Onyx Capital Group, uh, based in London. Jorge, it's great to have you with us. Well, it's great to be with you. It's such a nice Sunday here uh, in the day after the OPEC meeting. So, yes. So like let's start with that and get your thoughts on how you think that the oil market in principle should be or is interpreting these this plethora of, of, of announcements that we saw yesterday from the OPEC, uh, from eight of the OPEC members, but on behalf of the group. Yeah, I, I think it is always... The, the first course of action is to see what the reality is and not what the head thinks it is. So the reality is that the reaction has been very muted. Uh, prices are up slightly, we can say, or trading sideways based on where they settle on Friday. So in effect, no change because any price movement we have seen today has been within the normal bounds we would see any other Monday. So it's as if nothing has happened. If you're a policymaker and you make some significant decision and you have to bring people from all over the world to meet in person, and you have been trying to cobble a new agreement together, and the market reaction is nothing happened, I think you could say the meeting was a success. Uh, because you didn't disturb the market. Mm. If the idea was to create an upside in the price, which I didn't hear that was the objective, then the meeting was a failure. Uh, if some people were thinking that the market was going to collapse, they were also disappointed. So in reality, the outcome has been, I think, good for everybody. Nothing happened in effect. Okay, I mean, and and it is. It's only been twenty four hours as well. So so let's wait to see how you know even other players in the market might interpret what's been said. And and many things were. We won't repeat them here because I'm sure everyone watching this is aware of what was declared. But overall, the message is we're going to get we're going to see more oil come back uh, at certain points in time, as opposed to well, we don't know yet. We'll let you know again in three months' time. So that. That should be bearish, right? I mean, in this current ma- demand market, tell us, you know, again, was it was Absolutely. it too much, too much oil to be talking about coming back in the next twelve months? Absolutely, from an analytical basis, the outcome was very bearish because mm-hmm. new supply is expected to to come in. Counter to that is the reality that many OPEC members have been overproducing. Uh, I am sure in your program and in reality, anybody can see that Iraq has been way over the top in terms of overproducing. Um, Even places like Russia, which are in the plus side, uh, Mm. I'm sure people have been talking about the fantastic results that Rosneft had for Q1. And those results are, to a large degree, caused by the overproduction in Russia. And also, and there is the discussion about the UAE getting an additional 300,000 barrel per day permission. But based on the people I talked to, the UAE has been overproducing already and blending condensates into crude to increase the number of cargos available per month. So the has there been really a change in the net immediate result? And maybe the market hasn't had too much of a reaction because the overproduction was there. And this is why we didn't cross $90, but have been in a way fighting not to fall below 80. Uh, with some people expecting this overproduction to cause the market to crack through 80. But once we go into the Q4 and Q1, definitely more crude will come in because the guy, so to speak, and my apologies for not being totally 
fully in line with the language is the important member that matters is Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And more or less the feeling is, yes, they're going to start bringing more crude in in Q4, Q1. So the overall sentiment of the market is, from a supply point of view, bearish because more crude will come in. Yeah, and of course, we have also more crude coming in incrementally, gradually from non-OPEC countries, as it has been always. But again, last year, we had a very healthy US production uh, come in, beating expectations. That is set to at least continue this year, at least on that level, uh, from analysts' expectations. So again, you know, and, and, and it comes back to the whole question of, as OPEC has withheld this nearly 6 million barrels a day so far, you know, the market share thing has really gone out the window, hasn't it? It's sacrificing its market share for price, right? But on that price, they do want higher. You mentioned Saudi Arabia, Jorge. $80 doesn't cut it, does it, really? No, and Saudi Arabia uh, is spending as if there is no tomorrow, right? But they're not the only ones. It's every country that I know of that is seem to be belongs to the club of countries that is believed to be good and responsible are actually in a club where they overspend their budget and are actually the US, Europe, UK, and I would even put Saudi Arabia in that club. They're way over the top between their tax revenue, their GDP, and the rising share of debt. Of course, all of them justify it by saying we have these plans, we have these obligations, and Saudi Arabia has huge plans and obligations um, that are ongoing and needs to raise revenue. So the, the first thing is to either raise the production of crude and exports, which could cause a price collapse. So they don't want that. So they need to borrow money and they're doing that at a very steady pace. And uh, the other thing that is very important is they were selling shares in Aramco, which got mm. sold off very quickly. So there's market demand for those things. But as soon as the money comes in, essentially the money goes out, or the money that came in is to cover a previous uh, purchase they already did and they need to pay for. So the pressures to produce are there for OPEC. And the pressures in the US are there also to raise money. So the Counterbalancing global thing is whether we are going to have inflation led by the overspending by the US where they will be forced to print. So that could cause a price rise just because the currency is weak, but it doesn't mean that the price is really rising on a real term basis. Yeah. yeah, but also another reason that that oil prices, some argue, are not rising. I mean, one is that demand has been steady, lackluster, perhaps. Let's see what happens in the second half of the year in China uh, and in the U.S. economy uh, as well. But, you know, on the technical side, uh, why is oil lagging behind all these other commodities that have been sort of booming, uh, which indicates good economic growth, right? And a lot of people say, oh, it's just short positions in the market. It's all hedge fund stuff. And fundamentals should be stronger, should be indicating a stronger picture for oil. Yeah, I just came back from a trip to an emerging economy. And if I extrapolate, extrapolate from that example, the demand for hydrocarbons is continues to grow at a very steady pace. I would say upper single digits to low double digits. And that is the case in just about any country that is not in the upper northern hemisphere, from China to, to the US uh, going west. In the global south, demand is growing a lot. But as you mentioned earlier, we cannot forget that supply in the US is still mm. rising or could rise. Supply in Guyana is increasing, and there are many other projects which at $80 a barrel are very profitable. So you have the potential for new supply at the same pace that new demand is increasing. 
if one were to extrapolate five years into the future, one could say, one could make a very powerful argument that new supply is not keeping pace with that demand growth, but that is over the medium to long term. In the meantime, what we have is a price that is roughly $80, while there is hanging supply ready to come out that is, I don't know, 3 million barrels that could be turned on fairly quickly if, if OPEC decides Saudi Arabia in particular not to adhere or to accelerate the return of those barrels, if Kuwait decides to join in, if UAE goes all full out, we could mm -hmm. have 3 million barrels coming in uh, fairly quickly. So if we remain at $80, I would say it's a good number for yeah. the OPEC members and the other suppliers. Yeah, that would be. I mean, that's certainly what they want to protect as a floor. How much does China play a role, Jorge, going forward? Second half demand, outlook for the Chinese economy. It's still kind of like it's it's plateaued. Let's say it hasn't. Nothing new seems to have been breathed, breathed into the economy to to bring it out of its very very. Uh, it's several economic challenges, right? I mean, it's still growing. It's still it's still demanding oil, but there's a, still a lot of negativity out there as to whether it can be that. That savior, if you like, for 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 you know for for bringing this demand back that's required in the short term. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us thought the demand boost from China in the first half of 2024 would be surprisingly strong, um, and we were expecting massive uh, GDP growth. And if we compare what is happening in China. With what is happening with the with the West? Yes, growth is much higher than is happening in here where where I am, but it's not at the pace where India is. India is really blowing the socks off, uh, and it's becoming a, a, an example of what true growth is in a country that wants to grow and doesn't have too many constraints by central governments, right? So China at the moment, I would say, is disappointing in, in terms of GDP, in terms of recovering the real estate sector, in terms of industrial demand. It's just not hitting the, the right notes. And at the same time, we cannot forget, and we shouldn't forget, the technological changes that are happening incrementally every day. Uh, I think it is fair to expect that over time, uh, EV cars are going to find a stronger niche in consumer demand. Uh, a friend of mine was just telling me this morning that uh, the Chinese company BYD uh, is marketing a car that can go from Singapore to uh, Bangkok. It's a hybrid car. But in one full load, it can make it from Singapore to Bangkok. And once you have hybrid cars that can do that, the range of anxiety starts to disappear. Yeah. And you see EVs or hybrids chewing up a little bit more into, into traditional hydrocarbon demand. So we also need to monitor those developments. Of course. And I mean, and again, that has taken a bit of a, a retreat in that, you know, the, the there's there's been a bit of a sort of negative news around, uh, you know, battery cars, etc. That's impacted even certain metals like, you know, nickel and lithium in the last year or so. But no doubt that's still in the future. And China is very, very much at the forefront of pushing uh, that agenda. That's for sure. Jorge, let's just... Uh, Backtrack a bit. You mentioned inflation, and I want to talk a bit about the U.S. and Fed policy because, again, it's like: does the oil market listen to the Fed policy, or is it the other way around? You know, and how, what is what's really feeding into what we see now is a leveling off of inflation, arguably, which is a success, but uh, and an agreement that we're not going to see more than one Fed cut this year, if that. Um, that story has changed quite a bit, hasn't it, in the last three, four months on, on the expectation of rate cuts. How's the U.S. economy doing? Are we now going to see in the second half a slowdown? And are we seeing signs of that already? Yeah, the, the U.S. Um, has been really overusing 
his central banking power and led to a lot of monetary creation during the COVID years. That expansion in the monetary policy resulted in the inflation we we felt very strongly in 22 and 23 in real estate and various other mm-hmm. sectors. As we came out of COVID, those excesses uh, were pared down. And now the US is has tried to exit the monetary super creation, and that results in less inflation globally. At the same time, another factor that kind of boosted up the perception of inflation was the the recent rise in oil prices, which now, as we have indicated, have been capped. So it is reasonable to expect right now a between a stabilization of interest rates to maybe some minor cuts in Europe, maybe even a minor cut in the US. But the US has not addressed the debt issue. Yeah. Therefore, they still need to sell a lot of thresholds. And as we go forward into the year, the US will need more financing of its budget and existing debt. And that means selling more treasuries and interest rates are the inverse of the price of bonds. In addition, because of the overuse of the uh, US treasury power and government power, many countries are not so keen on buying US debt. And I, I am sure we all have seen how much China has sold down mm. in terms of its U.S. Treasury holdings. And that, by definition, when you sell something, the price of that something starts to decline. And the, and the inverse, as I mentioned, is the interest rates rising. So I don't think we should bank on too much of an interest rate drop. I think we'll be yeah. lucky if things stabilize. Yeah, higher for longer seems to be the way to go. And of course, that will, I mean, that is, I assume, rippling into, you know, your 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 basic US economy consumer, which, you know, mortgages, uh, expenses, et cetera. And, and many people are arguing that is going to start to filter through. But there's still equally a lot of liquidity sloshing around. Um, you mentioned China and and the US. Let's talk about them together and, and talk a bit about trade because um, and of course we've had a couple of recent moves by Biden, uh, ta- the tariff uh, you know applications on the EVs, uh, another one also uh, on on batteries, etc. Um, I mean that it's a pre pre election perhaps posturing. Um, Jorge, in your opinion, I mean what is what what could be the negatives of of sort of again ramping up this sort of tariff trade war, if you like, between China and US, who stands to benefit? I mean, China might now slap retaliatory uh, uh, measures on the US. Um, it, does it play to both their interests or who who stands out to be, do you think, the winner or loser on that? Uh, the winner is anybody who believes in isolation, who believes in autarky, that it's better to do things yourself, even if it's a little badly. The, the loser, by definition, is the global consumer. We all, yourself, myself, anybody watching this uh, program, anybody on the street, has been a net beneficiary of globalization. We can buy cheap clothing, cheap cars, in effect. Mm-hmm. Cheap glasses, cheap phones, cheap everything, because the world has been optimized through the process of globalization, where the best manufacturer of something can sell it to the one that is better at something else. This goes from food to consumer goods. But as the politicians need to be elected and sell dreams of autarchy into their voters, then they start severing the the lines and the connections in globalization. And that is really shooting oneself in the foot. So as the new regime of uh, EVs and new tariffs of China 
are, are put in place, the loser is the U.S. consumer who will need to pay more yeah. for everything else. And also suffers because there is no competition. What makes us better at everything is competing because we're always on our toes. And we always need to worry about a better product coming out. But if the tariffs keep those better products out, then we start getting lazy, don't we? Yeah. I mean, but there is this move, isn't there, to sort of nearshoring and onshoring since COVID, which was the, the, the result of literally a, a lack of movement and restrictions. But but you have the whole geopolitics that plays into that now, don't you, as well? And, and that sort of security of, of not being dependent, for example, on microchips, et cetera, coming from places like Taiwan and, and, and others. Uh, Jorge, we can't uh, finish this interview without talking about geopolitics again, because we haven't talked about the Middle East either, the risk, this risk premium that we saw come into the price for a while, uh, the oil price uh, a month ago or more than that, when we saw an escalation here in the Gulf, at least between Iran and Israel. Um, we've seen some rerouting of oil flows that's settled in. Um, but the risk premium, would you agree, is now at zero? I mean, in terms of what's in the price today and, and you know, Nothing can really bring that back except an all-out, obviously, uh, you know, Middle Eastern confront uh, escalation, which by all intents and purposes is not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's a very sad situation where all the civilians are getting killed uh, non-stop. Um, but for those that forget about the humanitarian side and focus on the insecurity of supply, I think they are not so insecure right now. They, they have been and continue to be rerouting since supply that are a little bit to the price because the longer you have to keep a ship going, the more expensive your freight would be. But it's not five to ten dollars, it's between maybe one and two. Mm -hmm. um, so the the world premium has essentially has essentially gone away. It's it's gone. Uh, now what we could see is that if peace comes, and I pray for it with me, is that then it could turn into, oh, now that things uh, are becoming much better, are we going to see the opposite greater supply coming in? Uh, but essentially, from a world premium point of view, right now we, we have close to zero. Yeah. Jorge, let's talk a bit about gas. Let's touch on gas markets, because, uh, of course, you know, we see a very different picture to what we had two years ago when the Ukraine-Russia war started. We've had the spike in energy prices across the board, especially uh, gas. And then we had the, the sort of uh, the, the cost of living crisis in Europe was hit particularly because of the gas uh, import issue. That's all settled down very nicely, hasn't it? I mean, would you agree that we're seeing uh, you know, almost all-time lows on on global gas prices, and the only way is up. What, what what's your forecast for that as a trend line? Yeah, markets uh, reset, and there was the impact of the pipeline getting blown up or gas line getting blown up in Europe, and the fear of uh, there is no Russian gas. So e everything rerouted, and now. Uh, prices are much lower than they used to be, and admittedly, they are still higher than they should be because they include mm -hmm. in general freight. Supply of gas has gone up globally and continues to, to go up. One of the things that is also affecting the price of gas is, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the growth in alternative supplies of energy. Because many countries right now get easily, at least in Europe, a third of their electricity supply from renewable sources. Um, we can talk a lot about them are dependent, they're not consistent, they go up and down, you need to create double capacity, whatever. We can talk about all those things. But in the meantime, the supply in many countries is at least 30% for the electrical base from renewables. And that means a direct impact on gas consumption because the world has gone through various phases in the last, let's say, 30 years, has gone from being fuel oil based 
to produce electricity, to being gas-based to produce electricity, to now being partly based on renewable. And that means as we move from one to another, that means the consumption of the previous one starts declining. So and this is, I think, one of the reasons why gas has behaved. But mm -hmm. then on the other hand, you have the unusual weather, hot weather in Southeast Asia, which tends to boost the demand for, for gas to correct for those things. But all, all those spikes in temperature and, and weather because El Nino or, or whatever other uh, short-term climate yeah. thing going on is short-term. Yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, Jorge, I want to jump back to the U.S. Uh, uh, oil scene and just get your get your view on uh, the M&A activity that we're seeing. You know, we had another uh, announcement in the last week of, of a, a proposed purchase uh, and, and, and merger, if you like, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. oil uh, shale patch. And just generally speaking, in, in, the, in the U.S. upstream sector, a lot of consolidation the last year or two you know, about 30% consolidation uh, and, and expected to continue. What impact does this have, do you think, on U.S. production overall over time? It, does it mean a more secure uh, trend line in production or, or, or not? I mean, how do you think it's going to impact, you know, the oil we're going to actually see in the market? Well, in any business, you tend to see uh, consolidation over time, uh, whether there is a merge between Chevron and Marathon, on any other company like that, those are the steady events. The regulators start to get a little uh, nervous when you see too much consolidation at the top end, the big mm -hmm. brand. But at the lower level, where you have the uh, shell producers, and there are many of them, if there's consolidation at that ground level, it doesn't attract the same level of attention. So I would expect more and more of those mergers at the ground level uh, to continue. That's nature doing its thing, choosing the winners and determining who the losers are or the less efficient ones. But that doesn't change the overall supply and the prospects of supply in the US. What changes the prospects of supply is price mm. is what determines it. So if we have price at $80, which is a very healthy price, you will have more efforts to produce shale oil because at $80, it is profitable at the margin. And if the price was, were to rise to 100, you will have more shale production, right? It, the, the production gets affected the other way. If you start heading into the 40, 50 level or below, then works the other way where production gets cut back. But at this level, I think we can expect still healthy growth in the US and not just in the US, we should look at places like Argentina and any other locations that actually have a lot of shale locations. Yeah. Would you agree, Jorge, that the only the only way is up for the oil price over the next few years? I mean, will we see new all time highs? Is that inevitable, along with all the other inflationary aspects that we have in the global economy? Well, one of the things I was thinking to be uh, very uh, uh, blunt with you is that we need to think in terms of the nominal price, and we need to think in terms of the real price. The nominal price, because of the inflationary and uh, money printing efforts in the US, is inevitable that it will rise. But that's because the currency is devalued. Mm. But if we think in terms of real terms, the history of the world has been that commodities fall on real terms versus everything else. And uh, in, in one of uh, previous interviews here, I, I, I noted that the price of oil relative to the price of uh, cappuccino, uh, coffee, and Starbucks is at an all-time low. Uh, a barrel of oil buys very few cups of coffee. And it, of course, process not at the uh, wholesale level. So oil will fall on a real-term basis. 
but on a nominal basis, it will continue to increase. Okay. All the more reason then why those producers want to keep keep the floor where they can and, and perhaps prop it up uh, to a healthier state, especially for the next few years while 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 it remains in its pre-peak, let's say, pre-peak demand for the commodity. Jorge Montecpec, MD of Benchmarks at Onyx Capital Group. Thanks so much for joining us today on Halftime Talk. It's been great to have you. Thank you so much. I hope I see you again soon.